First, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you very much for joining us. We are live streaming here out of the Fox 12 Oregon Newsroom, which is something we do every weekday starting at 1. I always like to remind people of that. You can, of course, download the Fox 12 Oregon app and watch us live or after the fact. But we're not always here in the studio. Sometimes we do actually go out and take a look at some other places. And that is what we're going to be talking about here with this segment. We took a trip down to just north of Corvallis to the McDonald and Dunn Research Forest, part of Oregon State University's forestry program. And we got to go out there, learn about the research forests on their own, but also learn about how they're utilizing things like robotics to help manage forests, monitor them, look for all kinds of different things. We're going to get into that into this interview. I did want to just give you a little bit of a reference point too here of where it is that we're talking about in case you aren't familiar with the area. You can see Corvallis there at the bottom and those two research forests that combine together are there just north of that. So that's where we were at during this interview. Now this is just part of OSU's extensive research forests. You can see uh, the, a bunch of them right there from around the state different kinds of terrain, different kinds of environments, you know, different ecosystems for each one of those. A Tualatin Mountain being one of the newest ones. We're actually going to be talking about that in another segment uh, coming up here in the next week or so. But this one is all about this forest. So one of the things that we did do here for this uh, segment is we spoke to Tom DeLuca, who is the uh, Dean of the College of Forestry, and to He Sung Woo, who's an assistant professor there, and that's where we talk about the robotics. But we learn a lot about what a research forest actually is. You know, what does it do? How, do, how does it work? Um, we get into that here with this interview and, uh, and a whole lot more. So we hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Tom, thank you for having us out here. I'm really excited to be here. Obviously, amazing backdrop, but for anybody who doesn't know, can you tell us about where we're at right now? Yeah, we're at the McDonald Dunn Research Forest, and this is actually a part that's called PB Arboretum. And the McDonald Dunn Research Forest is actually two forests totaling about 11,000 acres. And uh, the McDonald Forest was first purchased by the College of Forestry when it was a school of forestry back in 1926. So we're wow. just coming up on its 100th year anniversary. That's amazing. Yeah. So 100 years of that and, and with these two forests together, you know, a research forest. Yes. Can you tell us what, what that constitutes? What is a research forest? Yeah. The research forest is a place where um, our uh, faculty, staff and students have the opportunity and colleagues from around the globe have the opportunity to uh, conduct studies on all different aspects of forest science, wildlife biology, uh, soil science, hydrology, all those things that are questions that you might want to query when studying forestry and a ma in a managed forest setting. We do that here. So we have different types of treatments, uh, everything from a relatively small clear cut to a, um, a large thinning operation or a restoration type harvest where we're trying to uh, reestablish a historic type of vegetation that it doesn't uh, that doesn't show up well on the landscape today. And this is a place where all of those different fields can come together. And so you mentioned, you know, well, you covered a wide range of things right yeah. there, just alone. Yeah. But I imagine that's, you know, looking at things from an environmental standpoint, yes. ecological standpoint, but probably a commercial standpoint yes. as well. Absolutely. We're studying, you know, forest productivity and how, uh, you know, what kind of volume can be generated in different types of forest treatments. And those are everything from sort of short rotation even age forest management to uh, uneven age, multi-species, multi-age uh, cohort forestry. So talking about the commercial side of things, you know, just production of wood yeah. and, and trees and lumber, is this something, what you study here, that can help increase that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we have a, a very high demand for wood products in the United States, and as a matter of fact, we import one third of our total wood demand. So in the US, we're not even meeting our total demand that we have for wood products. And that creates an, envir an international environmental footprint that we have to be cognizant of. So we study ways of managing forestry to, to optimize wood production while also considering all these other factors like the environmental impact of the forest management. And it's really important that we 
we learn how to do it as well as possible here and optimize that so that we shrink that international footprint and also have minimal impact on our landscape. You know, for the general public, what do you think is the most important thing for them to know about the work that you do here and, and the importance of having a forest like this? Yeah, I think that, uh, first of all, um, this is a research forest and our objective is to study forest management practices on these landscapes. We do have it open, as uh, you can see by people recreating, mountain bikers, hikers, birders, and they love this forest. But a key thing for them to understand is that this is a managed forest that is managed for research. Managing a forest is super complex, and this is a place where we can study all different outcomes, including recreation. It's special that forestry as a practice, as a land management practice, is totally compatible with recreation. And you can't say that about most other uh, types of large-scale land management. You don't recreate in a cornfield or a wheat field. You don't recreate at a gravel you know, pit unless it <laughs> fills in and you're swimming in it. Yeah. But, uh, but forestry is because of the long rotations and because of the management and the sort of natural setting, people love to recreate here and, and we in, encourage that and we feel like it helps expand that their understanding of forest management while they're out recreating in that landscape. Really integrating so many different aspects all into yeah. to one thing here. And yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, incorporating that in, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I know something else too, you mentioned that uh, you know other fields also study here too, so all different kinds of yeah. your colleagues can, including robotics. Yeah. So thinking about robotics into forests, yeah. how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, robotics are uh, are just part of our future, and uh, they're they're part of our reality. Uh, they are re uh, replacing. Uh, you know what things that humans once did. They're replacing in all aspects of society and including in forestry and and we have uh, faculty and staff and students within the college that are studying robotics and different applications of those robotics to everything from uh, you know uh, forest inventory which is one of the most obvious ones you know having uh, remote sensed and and um, uh, understory uh, inventory done by ro robots as well as, uh, as uh, we'll talk about a little later, uh, everything from potentially tree planting to firefighting to, uh, to um, uh, uh, estimating slash pile volume. There's a whole host of things that can be uh, done with robots. I mean, that's pretty exciting, just seeing something like forestry, forestry management combined with this high tech, yeah. you know, cutting edge technology yeah. and seeing where it can all combine together yeah. and, and work together. Absolutely. Uh, should we take a look at some of this technology? Yes, yeah, yeah sure. I want to see some robots. I uh, am taking a look right here. We've got some robots in front of us in a forest. Tell me, tell me about this. Okay, so this robot is, uh, I designed for the you know, prototype and uh, right now we have faced uh, three different uh, difficult problems. So we have a wreck of the, you know, the, some uh, forestry worker mm -hmm. and also there is an aging issue. So most of the forestry worker is going to the old. Yeah. And also we face the dangerous situation in the forestry conditions, so safety. So we have three different uh, very challenging uh, 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 right now. So I think the robot is one of the key can solve the, that kind of uh, situation. So we designed this robot is for the prototype and I wanted this robot to investigate some first inventory data as a, with a 3D point crowd data with a 3D mapping. Uh -huh. So we, we can estimate a very high accuracy level of the uh, tree diameter, tree height, that kind of information can be captured using the, this kind of robot. And so this is something that you mentioned, so the forestry workers are aging yeah. and that's not being replaced by people going into that field. Most likely, it seems so like. So that is not only for the, the United States. So I came from South Korea, so mm -hmm. I, and also I worked in my PhD in Australia. Okay. So internationally, we face a lot of, the forestry has a, some problem, and uh, we got a uh, there's a young age has to be coming to the, this industry, and there is some, you know, the, uh, we have some challenges for that. Also, aging issues is one of them, 
a third one is the safety issue. Mm -hmm. So to solving the, that kind of uh, the issue, I think the robot can be the one of the good alternative option for that, you know, the labor stuff. So the, using this kind of a template here for this prototype that you have, you can manage all those different things. So you mentioned firefighting. How how would the robot help out in a firefight? That's a great question. So it, so. It has a limitation right now to access the rear for us, mm -hmm. but it can be the, the, the right now for us firefighter, they bring us lots of gear mm -hmm. to bring to their hands. So they have to grab lots of hands to uh, climb up to the, this steep terrain. But this kind of robot can be supporting the people to uh, to imagine like this uh, this robot can be bring lots of you know material in the near the forest, uh, at least the, the, the near the, the forest road, mm -hmm. and people can be bring their gear from that point to the, the access side. So that is great, you know, the supporting for the people. And also, I uh, we can put some kind of the, the, uh, water pump and hose. The robot can be bring the hose to the you know, actual fresh side. Wow. Yeah, so that can that is a, one of my mission for the next step. Yeah, is to get to that side of things. So yeah, bringing that gear, support, and potentially even yeah. fighting the fire with water. Yeah. Pumping water too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. And uh, then that's just a couple of applications here. So looking at these robots themselves, so this is, these are designed here at Oregon State? Yeah, actually, uh, so yeah, this, this one is for the prototype one, and it has one uh, LiDAR sensor and has a uh, high computing power in here, and also has a st uh, stereo camera, which is called like a depth camera. Mm -hmm. So it can collect all the 3D uh, point cloud data to create a 3D map. So this is all, all the computing power is in here? Exactly. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So are you using any kind of... Um, any kind of external source, I mean, as far as sending the data, or is this all processing powers yeah, in yeah, here? Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah, so you can actually see the real, da uh, real data collection in here. This is a real data map from the, this uh, area. So you can see the data. So this is a map of what we're around here. Correct, correct. Wow, and so you can take all this data, so you t send this out into the forest, yeah, there is use a, that LiDAR map. There is also, you know, the USB port in here, so you can, you can export in data to the lab, so. And also, you don't have to worry about the data is messed up or yeah. if data is correct. You can you can check all the data in here. And if there is no problem, you can just export the data to you know export the data right there. Um, well, you mentioned drones. Yeah. Can we take a look at how that drone works too. Yeah. So this is a, you know the we call the area you know radar system, radar okay. scanning system. So it has a radar sensor in here, so we can change the all the payload. It calls the payload. We can change to the multi-spectral, hyperspectral sensor. Okay. Or this is one of the you know sensor sensor type we can collect in the lidar system. So this is uh we can create the all the 3D mapping above the canopy. As I mentioned, this is great capturing the large you know landscape area, mm -hmm. and especially in forestry. So this is great to capture the large landscape area to uh, estimate the 3D mapping solution. Mm -hmm. But the problem is it has a limited to the you know ground penetrating from yeah. the leaves. So there is crown that if the crown is too dense, it is no is uh, there is a limited you know correcting data from the ground. Yeah. So because that reason we developing the, the on ground unmanned uh, vehicle yeah. rather than you know UAV stuff. So this would really be the two factor approach. You'd get take this, get that overhaul, but if the canopy is really thick, yeah. you have the robots underneath that would go through That's true. and back up that other yeah, data. Exactly. So talking about the ability to experiment in this forest, I mean, it's a research forest and you've got a research product right here, something that you developed. Can you tell us what this is? So this is like, a, so I came here a year ago and I met, I had a, a meeting with the industry people and I'm asking them what is the problem and what they want to do uh, using the ICT technology into their business. And they said, uh, if they really interested about the plantation, uh, the labor, you know, stuff. So, uh, it's like planting trees. Planting trees using the robot stuff. So I designed this one for the you know, UAV, like a drone. Uh -huh. So the, uh, a design for the, the uh, equipped with a heavy lift drone can carry up this one to the fly. And it can plant in the tree with a, you know, autonomous way. So this would be like putting a, sh a shoot in here, or a exactly. So you can so put a young plant. You can put the young plant up to here, and this little case go to the ground using the center, uh, using the gravity force. So there's places where nobody can walk to, nobody can get to. You can fly this drone up, and then correct. I, I did see a little bit of a demonstration. Can you show us how one of yes. these would? Uh, 
Yeah. Like wow, and one. I would be able to plant these trees right there in that spot. <laughs> so this is one, one of the prototypes. So, you know, we, we need to still, uh, lots of, you know, the, there is lots of, you know, the limitation because it has only three, uh, six roads per flight and flight time is not uh, wrong for the using the drone. So this is more just prototype of uh, my, uh, my interesting is if we have uh, some budget to uh -huh. the, well, to expand in this one to the trailer type using the unmanned ground vehicle, then we can actually try to the rear plantation robot. This is a perfect example here too of looking at what is being done here in this research forest right here at Oregon State, you know, locally, but stuff that can be applied everywhere, combining technology into the forest. I mean, it's really everything all coming into one. Thanks so much for having us out here. Thank you. Yeah, sincerely a huge thank you to them for having us out there and thanks to Ann Armstrong for shooting and editing that as well. You know, it's fascinating to, get to take a look at that and learn about how these things are happening, these research for, like this research forest, what Oregon State is doing out there, combining this robotics with what's happening there and everything else that they're doing. So huge thank you to all of them for having us out. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we will be talking about the Tualatin Mountain purchase uh, coming up here in another segment on another day. But you can follow along with all of our segments on the Fox 12 Oregon app or at kptv.com or if you're watching on YouTube, wherever you're finding us, thanks for doing so. We do appreciate it. And you can always send me an email, fox12now at kptv.com. If you have an idea for a segment, again, I can't guarantee we can always do that, but I would be happy to talk to you about that if you have something that you think should be covered, or maybe you have an idea for a segment here on Fox 12 Now where it's a deeper dive with one of our reporters on a story that you saw in one of our news shows. We can sometimes make that happen as well. But for now, we'll take a quick break. Thanks for watching. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.